This program is part of KET's ongoing initiative, Inside Opioid Addiction, Examining the Epidemic. Welcome to Health 360, where we discuss important health issues from three perspectives in 60 minutes. I'm Renee Shaw. As our nation and state continue to reel from the ongoing prescription drug and heroin epidemic, we look at the issue of prevention and how we can protect our young people from ever becoming addicted to any substances. In our first segment, we focus on the role of the family and learn how they are the first and most important line of defense. In our second segment, we hear how local communities are creating bold plans to reduce youth drug use by changing social norms. And in our final segment, we widen our lens and take a look at the evolution of prevention from just say no to a more holistic view of young people and their lives. First, we traveled to the 2017 Prescription Drug Abuse and Heroin Summit in Atlanta and interviewed some of the nation's top experts on prevention and the science of adolescent brain development. If kids don't get into trouble with drug abuse by the time they're 19, it's pretty unlikely they're going to. But if they're in trouble at the age of 13, the chance that they're going to end up lifelong is extremely high. So that's a very vulnerable spot there that we need to pay attention to, and every bit of effort is worthwhile in that place. The brain is not fully developed until about the age of 25. And the part of the brain that develops most slowly is the frontal lobes, which is, has to do with judgment, worrying, being concerned about consequences of things. The, the part of the brain that develops much earlier in early adolescence, most intensely, is the brain reward so that young people are primed for the drug experience because using the drug produces more brain reward than it does in older people and the restraining forces of the brain are reduced. And so what you have is a perfect storm of vulnerability during adolescence to the drug taking experience. The goal for prevention is really really simple. It's really, really clear. And that is that any use of alcohol, any use of nicotine, any use of marijuana, any use of other drugs by somebody under 21 is unhealthy. It is also illegal. And my mission is to get adults and kids to be able to articulate that health goal. You've just heard how vulnerable our children's brains are to drug use. Parenting a young person is always a challenge, but in today's fast-paced society, it's more difficult than ever because the dangers are ever-changing and parents don't always know what temptations their children are facing. Our guests in the first segment understand these issues very personally. Kayla and David Green lost their beloved son to an overdose of heroin laced with fentanyl and founded the Dominique Jason Green Foundation in his honor, which provides resources to those who are seeking a path out of addiction. Jean Shum is the mother of five children who started Operation Parent, a nonprofit that provides ongoing education, support, and hope to those raising teens and preteens in today's culture. Thank you all for being here with us. And uh, to the Greens, uh, first of all, you have my sincere condolences Thank you. Thank on you. the loss of your son and the bravery that you all have in your activism and, and through your pain, uh, working to help others is certainly to be applauded. If you would, tell me about your son, Dominique, and his journey and why you're here today. Okay. Um, I'll just start out saying Dominique was our, our uh, youngest child. We have two older children, uh, and Dominique was 23 when he passed from the heroin overdose that was laced with fentanyl. He, start, he got started on drugs uh, with the pills. Uh, we found out y years later, of course, after he had passed away, that um, he played football for the high school, and he w they were hanging out at a, a booster mom's house. And this was a house unbeknownst to parents that they were free to, the children there, they were free to drink and, and do drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, that parent was more interested in being 
a friend to her child than to, you know, parent her child. So that's how it all got started. Yeah. I've heard you both have told other media outlets, Mr. Green, that uh, you didn't know that heroin is, was in your home. Uh, you know, talk to us a little bit about that. Um, <clears throat> I was a type, uh, I'm the type of dad that, uh, I don't know if a strict is the right word, but I didn't, uh, we didn't, Kayla and I didn't even allow our kids to shut the door when friends were over. We were just, you know, um, always wanted to be aware of what was going on. Mm -hmm. And when things start looking different for Dominique, I think I was in more denial because how could it get past me? Right. My two older children never had done drugs or anything like that. So I was like, it was something's going on. And Kayla's like, he's probably doing marijuana. I said, yeah, it's maybe it's just something he's going through in school or whatever. You know, I had all kinds of answers. It initially, but it couldn't have been drugs, you know. Okay. Uh, when we found out it was drugs, Dominique was a type of child. He never, ever disrespected us. Um, he was a type that always would call, Mom, I'll let you know the, it's raining outside. Be careful. Dad, uh, uh, how you doing? I'm just mm -hmm. calling to tell you I love you. He's, and he, up to when he passed away, he, uh, he would call, he love you. He would still kiss me on the cheek. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, you know your children. So it was one of those things like we knew something was wrong. Um, he came and told me, Dad, I need help. He, he was on pill. To you. He admitted it to it. And I understand yeah. he had overdosed twice before the fatal overdose. Is that correct? Five, Five times. times. Five times. Five times. Mm -hmm. And so yes. how, how did you try to help him get help? Uh, after the first overdose, uh, when we learned that he was using heroin, and like I said, didn't even know heroin existed. I mean, we'd heard of it in the 70s, but right. I didn't even, was aware that it was out again. So at the hospital, they told us that it was a heroin overdose. Um, we just tried to figure out, you know, I tried to learn as much as I could about it, reading about it. I work in a family medicine department. And so I spoke with a provider there that was, that was uh, knowledgeable in opiate use, and, and, and he gave me some direction. And actually, uh, he was Dominique's provider. So we said, he said, the first thing with heroin is that it has to be treated differently than any other of the other drugs out there, like alcohol and things mm -hmm. like that. That it would require extensive treatment, preferably in-house treatment, and uh, it would it would take a long time because uh, it completely changes the the brain chemistry. So, in order for it to be effective, he needed long-term treatment. Right. And Jean, just real quickly, mm -hmm. you founded uh, Operation Parent. So if you can, just give us uh, a quick synopsis of the mission of that organization and how it tries to help sure. parents in similar situations. Well, our mission is to provide ongoing education, support, and hope to anybody that's raising a teen or preteen in today's culture. And I, I tend to think that the words today's culture are the most critical part of the mission statement because the culture is aggressive it's toxic and it's changing all the time and so what's happened to the greens could happen to any family mm -hmm. it's very hard to keep up with what's going on out there and what our kids have access to and so uh, the purpose of our uh, organization is to just try and uh, provide that ongoing education uh, for parents all the time to be a trustworthy and a safe place where they can come get good information and also get ongoing support because we we do a lot at, at Operation Parent but we want to make sure no parent ever feels alone uh, right. during those teen and preteen years. Yeah, very difficult years certainly. Well many times we hear that drug experimentation is a rite of passage among adolescents. We now hear from national experts that address that issue. The, the idea that adolescent drug use is normal or even desirable, and the term of art that's used is experimentation. I think it's really weird if you unpack it and look at what does that really say? What are you talking about? What are you experiment? Uh, you know, a kid said to me, I didn't want to smoke cigarettes. I said, why didn't you? He said, because I thought I might like it. Well, that's right. That's the right answer. What are you talking about experimenting with it? Uh, people who experiment with the drugs, a lot of them like the drugs, and a lot of them like it a lot. Is that an experiment you really want to do? What do you think about experimenting with not wearing a seatbelt? What do you think about experimenting with not wearing a helmet? 
Do you know what happens if kids do an experiment with not wearing a helmet or, or not wearing seat belts? I can tell you what happens. Not a darn thing. It confirms for them that it's a waste of time, that experiment. That's an experiment we don't want kids to do, and it's the same thing with using alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana and other drugs. Parents will say that often is, well, I let you know my kid, I, or I drank when I was their age and I turned out fine, or don't worry, I'm gonna let them drink at my house and they're gonna be safer there. The first thing I tell them is that the evidence and the research overwhelmingly points out that youth listen to their parents more than anybody else. Parents don't think that. They think that they're listening to their peers first. We hear about peer pressure all the time, right? But when you actually look at the data, they listen to their parents. They may not tell them they're listening to their parents, but they do. And a lot of youth, most of our youth, do not want to disappoint their parents. So they're their first line of defense. So the first thing I remind them is actually they're looking at you for guidance and leadership. The other thing I remind them is just the science of the developing brain. The brain does not finish developing until age 24. So anytime you're picking up a drink, smoking a cigarette, marijuana, opioids, whatever the case may be, you are permanently damaging the brain. Kayla, to get to your point, you mentioned earlier about the brain chemistry had changed in your son, Dominique. And when you hear those experts talk about that brain development during those very formative teen years, I'm sure all of it makes sense to you. Mm -hmm. But to get to the point about talking to your kids, it seemed like Dominique didn't want to disappoint either right. of you right. and tried very hard mm -hmm. to put up a front that I'm okay and I've got mm -hmm. this under right. control. Right. Do yeah. you feel right. that, that he was trying to protect you yes. in many ways? Yeah. Yes, he was. He was that that type of child. He, you know, wanted to make sure that he wasn't worrying us. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. that we wouldn't worry. It's okay, Ma. I'm okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna be okay. I'm gonna beat this. Um, so we did get him into treatment immediately. Uh, the the thing too is there are just not enough facilities and not enough beds. If there are facilities in the area, I called so many. Uh, the first time he overdosed and. It's, it can be critical because if there's not a bed available, they have a potential just waiting one night could be the difference between life and death. Yeah. So. The warning signs, it seemed, David, that you were almost saying.